Edmonton. So it was good to meet you, Eric, and some others that might be on the call. So, yeah, we're going to run through some slides and then uh, but we'd like to keep this open for any questions throughout. So don't hesitate to just speak up and, and ask questions. Um, just a quick background. We're a family construction company for 76 years. Um, my great grandpa was putting in wood furnaces back in the 40s and we, it evolved to a construction company that we got into geothermal about 20 years ago. We renovated an old paper mill in, Al in Alpena, Michigan, Northeast Michigan. And uh, we put eight water furnace units in, uh, had an old well on the property. So that kind of got us into this idea of using uh, of open loop which you know, isn't our idea, but we'll, we'll, we'll show you what our uh, twist on it is. And uh, in the last uh, 12 years, we've been putting in what we call Well Connect uh, in Michigan with uh, over 1,400 installations here. So we're just working our way to the Northeast now and uh, uh, good to meet up with the Efficiency Vermont folks. So uh, as most of you know, rural homeowners are paying double to heat their homes those that don't have access to natural gas. And uh, I know that's that's prominent in, in Vermont with propane and heating oil or electric. Um, many people just turn the temperature down and live in a colder house or a lot of people burn wood or wood pellets. That's very popular up here in Northern Michigan. And uh, they're all generally, you know, high emission options that people have to, to use. So when you did the numbers in Michigan, we, we focus on Michigan a lot because one, we live here, two, we have a million wells. Um, you know, it's a billion dollar premium that rural homeowners are paying to, to heat their homes. So as you guys all know, there, you know, heat pumps are the future and there are a few varieties of that, of course, air source, uh, ground source. And by the way, we are huge fans of all of these. Uh, the building that I'm sitting in is, is heated with our five of our systems. Uh, across the parking lot, our construction company is all closed loop geothermal. My home is closed loop geothermal. Uh, Chris Lehman, who's our technical director, has been in closed loop and open loop geo for 40 years and has had it in his home. So we're big fans of all that. Uh, we just, you know, feel like it's out of reach for many homeowners, uh, rural homeowners. So, um, but we've always loved the efficiency of ground source. And then, of course, open loop. And our system is open loop, but it's again, it's a it's a version of that which we'll explain. Uh, so we basically just said let's let's not worry about you know load calculations and trying to size a system for the coldest day of the year. And, and like one of the presentations in Burlington two weeks ago, which was on uh, supplemental heating for heat pumps, it's a small percentage of the total winter that it's really cold, and and the climate in Michigan, I'm probably a notch colder than Burlington. So we've been putting our system in for many years. Um, and what we're seeing basically is the application of the 80-20 rule is working. So we're not worrying about those, those handful of coldest days. Our, our little one and a half ton unit in many cases does a great job of supplying 80% of the heat. Our two and a half ton is more popular and it often on average supplies 90% of the heating during the winter. So what's different about ours? So unlike other dual fuel setups where the, the heat pump has to shut off and we recognize there are cold climate heat pumps, certainly the efficiency is down, but they have to shut off at some point when capacity, you know, when, when, when it's just too cold out. And what we've done is we, we've gone the opposite direction where running simultaneously is a good thing. And we basically have a damper over the well connect and a damper over the furnace so that we can run these in tandem. And as a result of that, our sm on average smaller units can handle a much greater percentage of the total heating load because we're not shutting them off at all. I mean, as long as the house is falling for heat. The furnace kicks on for five, 10 minutes to supplement, shuts off and the cycle, the cycle repeats. And as a result of that, we need in most cases, just two GPM total to, to again, supply 80, 90% of the heating. And of course, all of the air conditioning. So that simultaneous operation is a big deal. That's one of our, the patents we have is on that approach. 
Um, this just, I know it's a little hard to see this, but this just shows the air source or COP is obviously dropping as the temperature drops. We all know that. So the supplemental heating in blue is greater than you see with, well, we, we, we are, we are hybrid. We need supplemental heating with ours, but the amount we need is dramatically less than an air source system. And this just looks at bin data. Basically, the green is what the well connect supplies, and the red would be the supplemental propane or or fossil, you know, heating oil. We generally feel that keeping that on property is 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 a good thing versus i mean you can do supplemental electric when there's not much needed but you know people may be doing hot water or cooking with it or they have a generator that has to run on propane so we think the 80 20 rule we can help a lot more homeowners than going 100 percent electric and that's the general approach we're taking with this so this is an example of a home with a 50,000 btu load and our two and a half ton unit, again, is doing over 90% of the heating because of that simultaneous operation setup that we, we employ. And this just shows over the heating season, you know, September to, at least in Michigan, we still heat in June. Uh, you know, the red is just a supplemental heating that's needed. But again, we're we're not shutting off the, the, the geo during the coldest days. We're running, we're running full bore there, so. Um, so the three kind of unique things, the hybrid setup, again, where we're running simultaneously, uh, we've, we've really tried to require as little water flow as possible so that more existing water wells can be candidates for a renewable energy source. So our two systems run on two GPM or three and a half total. Uh, we aren't claiming that we're more efficient with the water. We're just using a lower flow rate overall. And then because it's an add-on system, most installs can be completed in one day. Uh, we have a contractor in Northwest Michigan that by himself puts in systems in about eight to 10 hours. And uh, not every job's the same, you know, they're all, they're all actually different, but the point is that it's a, a pretty quick install, which keeps the cost down. So, well, I'm gonna show you a chart. I won't go through all this data, but we compared propane 92% furnace and a three a typical air conditioner 14 sear with a cold climate heat pump, a well connect two and a half ton and a closed loop geo system. With some of the electric rates for, for Vermont, I use, I think Vermont or Green Mountain Power, I think is 19 cents and I use three bucks a gallon for propane. And here's our design temperatures. But in a nutshell, uh, this is the cold climate heat pump. So the green is the amount of savings on heating and cooling that a homeowner would realize versus propane. And the blue is the cost of the system finance, the net cost after incentives, uh, with I use the 4% at 10 years. So basically, you know, geo and, and the this is well connect in the middle and this is closed loop geo. We're, we we generally, generally save about the same amount of money and you can see the cost difference in the system. We're typically less than half of a full system. And when you look at cold climate heat pump, again, nice savings and, and you can see the cost of our system. Now, up front, we're about on par typically with cold climate heat pumps, but the incentives, I use the Efficiency Vermont incentives on this. It did, it did help obviously with the geo over the incentives for, 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 for air source, but so we think there's a good place for all three of these. We just want to, you know, uh, offer WellConnect as a third option. Uh, maybe there's more. I mean, I know pellet stoves are popular and wood stoves and all that. But in terms of heat pumps, you know, we've really tried to make this competitive with air source on upfront cost, but with the efficiencies of ground source. Um, Every one of our systems comes with a real-time performance monitor. So we are able to, to watch the performance. This just shows a 24 hour period and where you see the outgoing air temperature bumping up from say 90 degrees to 90, 93 or four, that's the furnace kicking on to help out. This is a February example here in Michigan. Um, 
So that's an example of the hybrid. And this is over a 30 day period. The well connect might run 24 hours a day. That's the Y axis. And the red just shows the furnace kicking on occasionally. So this is typically what we'd see. This is a 12 month view. So a homeowner can see this picture on their phone or they've got their own address to see their information. And this just shows, this was taken at the end of the year. Uh, the well connect ran 3,400 hours in heating mode and the furnace ran nine hours total all winter. So again, it's highlighting the, the, bent, the value of that simultaneous operation. We're not shutting off the, the little geo unit, even when it's really cold out. Um, and then this just shows how many gallons of propane were eliminated. So over 1,100 gallons in this example. And then we track the cooling hours and kilowatt hours, and we also track the well pump separately. So, you know, while our Energy Star uh, test shows that we're really, you know, five COP, we, we really use about four COP net of the well pump. Uh, this is a one and a half ton example here, ran 3,600 hours and the, the furnace ran 75 hours all winter. So this is a, I know everyone says there's never a basement that this is this nice, but this is a, basically the installation here. So we're adding an additional pressure tank. Our goal there is that while the system's running, we wanna keep the well pump cycles to a minimum. So ideally a, a 10 minute cycle, two minutes on, eight minutes off as a target. Um, so that keeps over the, if a, if a pump is designed to cycle, say, 300 times in a 24-hour period, we're keeping that to half of that, of that rated frequency to sustain, to, to maintain the life of the pump. Uh, 220, 20-amp 20 circuit to, to run the unit. Um, so water in, water out, and then we just add the supply and return. There's a plenum on the back that we sell with the machine. And water discharge typically looks like this. We are not going, we had done some standing column, but we generally, with our low flow rate, we're generally going to a bury a drain tile, much like you'd see a sump pump discharge out of a home and, uh, and, and run that water back to the earth. Uh, three options. We actually started out just making these, what we called, you know, standalone units. And then we have a self-ducted option and most of our installations are existing ductwork where we're just running a supply and return, um, as you see here. This is a example of a home that was baseboard propane. And we just did a couple supplies and a return and that home now knocked down their propane by over 80%. And they never had air conditioning before and now they do. They used to cover all these windows with sheets in the summertime. So they're they're real happy. And this is where we started, just again, selling these standalone units. We still do some of that for cabins and cottages, but generally we're doing the integrated design. And then there are cases where we'll put a electric duct heater in series with the unit as supplemental heating uh, in cases where there maybe isn't room to keep the, the fossil fuel furnace. So, this is a quick snapshot of the installations to date. Um, again, we have our first system we put in 2012 is purring along. Uh, one thing I'd highlight is that we, we installed hundreds of these ourselves and we wanted to live with the system A to Z and that allowed us to really improve the, the box, the heat pump, if you will, to make it easier to install and uh, you know, just figure out you know which homes are good applications and which aren't, so that we can really guide our dealers to help them be successful with this. And uh, again, it's we have dealers that are putting in you know multiple units per week that have been doing that for for years now in, in Michigan. So you can see we're just getting starting to get some systems installed in the Northeast. Um, so yeah, Energy Star certified in, in Canada and US um, and uh, it works. So this is a snapshot of all the existing, well, people that are supplied by, by, by wells. So there's, 
you know, there's there's a lot of already we're we're trying to it's, it's basically a retrofit existing home application that we designed this for. We do put these in new construction, but generally speaking, we're trying to help the rural homeowner that maybe he's tired of burning burning wood and wood pellets, and and this is another option for them to just uh, make that easier and get air conditioning. So, I think I yeah, this is our first project we did. I mentioned with the eight water furnace units, and then. This is uh, this is our facility here. We make the units in Northern Michigan, and we're running. We have a we drilled a well, and we were fortunate to get a flowing well. As Chris said, manna from heaven for an open loop geothermal manufacturer. So we heat and cool our 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 facility with a with a well. So that's it. I just kind of ran through that quickly, but um, happy to answer any questions and I just want to show too here this is an example of a live logger operating right now so uh, today it's run three hours I think this is a Michigan example but since January 1 it's run 1700 hours and uh, the furnace has run 35 hours so pretty typical and we get if, if we see the outgoing temperatures I think what is it Chris over like 105 degrees we'll get an email alert that people and we'll call the homeowner and say you need to change your air filter. So it does provide some uh, monitoring of the systems in real time. So that's very it's very useful for diagnostics. Um, it's constantly monitoring and and uh, illustrating the water in and water out temperatures, air in and air out temperatures. So you can tell if uh, either the water or air filter might be blocking before there's any issue. Um, there are daily alerts generated on, on units that have either approaching uh, problem uh, conditions or have uh, locked out for some reason. And the alert goes to, we get all of them and they also uh, can go to the contractor who installed the system. Um, so you can call a customer up and say, by the way, you know, you need to clean your water filter. Your discharge water is getting a little cold. And um, sometimes you scare them by telling them this kind of stuff, you know, um, but usually they're very appreciative. And it's uh, it's a great tool as, you know, as well as monitoring the performance of the unit and efficiency and, and uh, savings on the fossil fuel. One of the things we can see here is the we can we can see the well pump cycles these you know little uh, chatter here so it really does also tell us if the system we there's of course a startup report that each contractor completes but we we can always see if the, the well pump cycles are are healthy or not and then we can address it uh, before there's any issues so. Thank you very much, Tim and Chris. It looks like I don't know if you I might have said something about it, but we do have one question in the chat here, and that is, okay. how does the eighty twenty model work out for new construction, considering chimney costs and et cetera? Chris, you want to take that one? I didn't. I didn't hear the new, end of that. New construction. So we got we got our eighty twenty approach. What do we do on new construction? Yeah. Well, you know, as as Tim said, we this was really designed as a retrofit system. Uh, where there's an existing heating system in place to provide the supplemental heat. Now, we there are a lot of people that want to put this in a new construction home. Um, so you just need to make sure there's some sort of supplemental heat, whether they want to add an inexpensive propane furnace. Um, you know, no, no reason to go to a variable speed two stage or anything like that, because the amount of time it's going to be used, that generally doesn't pay. Um, or electric supplemental like you would do with any other, uh, typically with a, any other geothermal system. Um, but you want some kind of supplemental heat if for whatever reason, you know, you've got plumbing in the, in the system as well as in the house and you don't want to let that freeze if there were an issue of some, site, some type. But yeah, really the target market for this, as Tim mentioned, is the rural homeowner who doesn't ha who has expensive heating because they don't have access to natural gas. Um, and typically if a home doesn't have natural gas, they don't have municipal water either. So there's generally a water well on the property. So the idea was how can we use this water well 
to provide a good amount of heat, but not disturb the domestic water usage. So we need to use a small amount of water. Um, and basically you're set, you're letting these people know you've got, you already have a water well on your property. So you've got half of the geothermal system there. You've got the, the heat exchanger, the ground section. Um, so how can we take advantage of that and, and get a lot of cheap BTUs out of it? So that was the idea. Um, tried to use the least amount of water possible. You know, we pushed the window a little bit on that. We're, that, that works out to about a little under a gallon and a half per minute per ton. Um, but the unit is well protected, uh, more so than most other geo units that just uh, protect against freezing with uh, refrigerant line temperatures. We're also using a flow switch um, in addition to temperatures so that uh, if it should start to slush up at all, it's gonna shut down. And then we've got some logic in our control boards that don't allow, that doesn't allow the uh, system to continue running in that condition. So, um, but yeah, new construction, uh, you can do it, but you've got to come up with some sort of supplemental heat to, to go along with it. And you know, the 80-20 is an average. There's, there's, there are installations where we're doing 100%. There's, Installations where we might be doing less than uh, the 80 20 just depends on the load of the specific structure. Um, you know, I don't know if, uh, if you guys got it, but Tim mentioned that, you know, we'd like um, dual fuel is becoming much more attractive again, an idea of hybrid because this all electric uh, push towards all electric is beginning to be. You know, it, it, the reality sets in that if you've got a ton of heat pumps out there with 10, 15, 20 kilowatts of supplemental electric heating on them, and you get a really cold night and everybody's going on to their supplemental heat, uh, the uh, electric providers could have a big issue. Instead of a summer peak demand, or we're transferring that to a winter peak demand that could be far greater than uh, you would see if it's just the heat pumps themselves running. So, Fossil fuel makes sense there. And again, most of these homeowners who have propane or oil on their property, um, particularly propane, uh, like to have it there for other reasons. Uh, one of the big ones is generators. I mean, everybody's putting generators in these days. They got to have some fuel for it. So to leave some gas on the property is generally uh, uh, acceptable to the homeowners. In fact, uh, desirable for, for a variety of reasons. Um, so, you know, it's really a dual fuel focus. So on a new construction job, you would probably want to put some kind of a, a furnace in there. Would generally wouldn't add that much cost to the project. Uh, one addition to mention is our, I don't know. If... Easier if I took the whole screen here. Yeah. Tim, if you're talking, I don't think we can hear you. Sorry? You you were muted when you were showing us that uh, oh. system. Okay. Well... We could, we'd be happy, you know, what we'd want to do today was introduce this and if any of my parents could do what was on, would like a more you know, detailed meeting to get into the cuts and uh, we can do that. But again, we, we built these with a lot of it, you know, as I say, integrated parts that a lot of geo units don't come with. And we, our whole point was to make it efficient to get the unit installed. You know, we're ideally trying to get you in and out of the house in one day. Thank you. We do have a couple more questions here. We had a question about what is the water consumption on one of these? Yeah. Chris, do you want to? Yeah. Um, the two models are our smaller unit, 18,000 BTUs, uh, uses two gallons per minute. There's a flow regulator in it for two gallons per minute. Um, the 30,000 BTU unit uses 3.5 gallons per minute. Um, 
And, you know, again, these were made to be installed simply so the flow regulator comes with the unit. Uh, there's a take a water valve in the unit, um, shut off valve. Really, it's been designed to be almost like a washing machine, hose in, hose out, plug it in, turn it on. Um, other than the duct work and, you know, putting a thermostat on. Um, quite simple. But uh, yeah, that water flow rate, as I said, is, is about as low as you can typically go um, and stay out of a, a freeze up, uh, freezing your discharge water on the heating cycle. Thank you. Also, I'll add a note for the folks attending. If you do have a question that you want to ask, feel free to raise your hand and I can unmute you if you'd rather just ask a question verbally rather than putting it into text. That being said, we're going to jump into the next question here. We have one that's asking about what is the max percentage of well capacity that you'll take for geo from the well total yield? Maximum or minimum? I mean, we're, we do a, if I'm understanding the question, we do a two-day flow test, uh, typically at 5 GPM, and have the homeowner, you know, go about their day, shower, clean the dishes, um, we want to make sure that yield is there on the well. So we, we want a minimum. Um, but I, the question, I think, was what's the maximum? I'm not sure I understand that question. Yeah, it's like they were well, asking. percentage, I, I may be asking, uh, say, if the well yield is five gallons a minute and you're using three and a half for the geo, is that is that the question? Would that be acceptable? Let me um, uh I don't mind to interrupt. Sorry, Chris. Uh, Dexter Sorry. is on. He's the one who asked the question. I'll, I'm going to uh, unmute him so he can ask. Okay. All right, Dexter, you should be all set. See, I got to hit my unmute button. This is a new version of Zoom. Hey, um, so, yeah, so if you did like a five gallon a minute test for two days, would you take up to two and a half or up to four or up to five? So, what percentage of that? yield which would be the result of your two-day test would you the max that you would take for the um, um geo system well if it, yeah go ahead. no i'm i'm still not sure i'm following well that. it'd be if it, it'd be three and a half would be the max we would take so that's why we want that you know five total to and a lot of times the contractors will just put our three and a half flow regulator on and then again the house uses their so that simulates the unit running nonstop for a couple of days, kind of worst case, while they're still using their household needs. Okay, so for a three and a half GPM geo load, do you want a minimum of 48 hours at five GPM? Is that right? Correct. That and gives a you a little cushion, a little cushion yeah. on the test. Yeah, um, and a, so a larger system would require a larger flow and a smaller system could maybe get a smaller flow. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Um, cool. Thanks. That answers my question. Yeah. The main thing to keep in mind is, you know, every every home is going to be a little different and you try to get as much data on the well as you can going in. Um, I think Vermont has some well uh, database available. I know in Michigan we have a pretty good one available. Um, but, you know, you can't always trust the data, particularly some of the older, older data on these uh, on these wells. But you know, the one there are a lot of not so much in Michigan. Um, and as Tim mentioned, we don't do much standing column in Michigan because it's mostly relatively shallow sand wells, um, very few bedrock wells like you have up in your area. Um, but if you've got a low yield well, you got to keep in mind if you've got a two gallon per minute well, you're not going to support a uh, open loop geo in any case, you know, um, unless you can run something on one gallon a minute. But whenever your your long demand, your long duration demand um, exceeds the yield of the well, you're going to have a problem. So that's when you might want to look at a standing column if you've got the got the column available. Thank you, and thanks, sir. Thanks for chiming in on that and better explaining that than me reading it through the chat. So I appreciate that. Thank you very much. We have one more question, and that is, many homes in Vermont, New Hampshire, have forced hot water, heat, and baseboard. What ideas do you have for homes with that situation? 
Yeah, I would just go back to the example here of what we call self-ducted. And this is, uh, again, we have a lot of these applications in Michigan that we do, whether it's uh, a crawl space even, but um, often a couple supplies. Again, since we're not worried about designing this for the coldest day of the year, um, you know, we, we uh, a couple supplies in return will often do the job. Sometimes, you know, contractors will add a half a dozen supplies depending on the, the structure of the home. But this self-ducted is a very good solution in, in, those, in those cases. So long as, again, the well checks out and that there is a place to run some, some, uh, some supply runs to the home. Um, double, you know, two-story homes, Obviously, those are more challenging. We, but if it's a single-story home that has a basement or crawl space or utility room, this self-ducted option works great. Cool. Thank you. Ben, do you, do you uh, have your hand raised? Do you have a question? Thanks, Alex. Um, not necessarily a question. Um, well. Yeah, Tim, I was hoping that you could tell us a little bit about um, the installations that are already in Vermont, and you're already working with a, a somewhat local contractor across the border in New Hampshire. Um, yeah. When we first uh, started talking, I was maybe a little surprised, um, or I just I, I was you know unaware that you already have some at least one system, if not more, already in Vermont. So could you just tell us a little bit about the history that you have already uh, in the state? Yeah, I mean. Chris and I were chatting yesterday and we'd been uh, talking to Jake Marin, I think three or four years ago, quite extensively. And then as you can see, we got kind of busy in Michigan. <laughs> so we took our eye off the Northeast ball for a bit there, but yeah, uh, just a handful of contractors in the Northeast. Uh, we've been working with AGB out of uh, Littleton um, who Peter, you and I met there last year. Um, and then we spoke at the New York Geo Conference last year, and so we've, and we're working with a distributor out of New York these days. So we're, again, just kind of getting our feet wet, so to speak, out there. Yeah, the, the, I think I have up here, if I can just pivot to this real quick, tell me if you guys can see my map. Uh, but we have, in West New York, uh, NYSERDA just launched a pilot with uh, Steuben Electric Cooperative um, out of Bath, New York, and we're, we're doing a 200 unit pilot there with them that just launched two weeks ago. And so we're starting to build out that part. But yeah, just a couple units uh, installed in Vermont at this time and in, in New Hampshire. But we see that area is really, uh, again, making sure the home's a good fit, but a, a, a great opportunity to for your folks to consider geo this version of geo um, as an option to looking at the air source units so yeah yeah thanks I, and i just kind of wanted to point that out just to call attention to it just to you know note that there already has been at least um you know there's already a contractor locally uh working mm -hmm. with you and you've got you know uh, a system that's been in a few years now is that correct uh, this one is uh, actually one year ago. I, I did the one visit myself when I was coming up to see you, and yeah. uh, he bought he bought the next uh, the next month there. But um, we have we we get a lot of leads from around the country, and and we just we just don't have the boots on the ground local installers to take advantage of those. But we do we do generate a lot of leads, and so we um, we, we will often ask homeowners, you know, who's your local contractor you like to work with, and that often does the trick and then that contractor event often becomes a, a dealer with us so um but you know the incentives are are attractive i mean when you're looking at you know 2100 hours a ton and uh the, the federal tax credit i mean we're a lot of people are into a geo system our version of it for you know four five six grand or in, in uh in about a day's install and over, overnight, they're literally put themselves in a much better position from a heating cost, the cooling efficiencies, and 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 so forth. The home, you know, people people like the savings, but we they rave about the comfort that they get with this kind of. It's almost like a the the constant fan with ours because we're running longer cycles. The temperature in the home does not fluctuate as much. It's a nice steady temperature 
yeah. uh, all winter and, and summer. So, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, the last thing I want to say on that is, you know, what I really like about this, and we've been saying this the whole time, is that, that this is a, a nice, like, affordable geothermal system for homes, uh, for for our home Vermonters who have, you know, whose homes are the right fit for this. Um, as you mentioned, twenty one hundred dollars a ton um, for a project that's probably going to cost, you know, t around ten thousand dollars or less. Um, that if even if a, someone is not um, doesn't have the tax liability to be eligible for the tax credit, um, they, they can still, you know, do something like in Vermont, we or through Efficiency Vermont, we work with a couple of um, financial institutions to have something called the home energy loan. And that's got a cap on it of like, I think $30,000 or something like that. So for a lot of geothermal, like a, a typical geothermal project, that that's beyond reach for um, for most, for, for that, for that loan. So if a customer who maybe you know, they can use the the rebate to bring down the price, but then they can take advantage of this home energy loan. Mm -hmm. And that could really maybe put them in some sort of like cost neutral situation as they pay <clears throat> as they pay back the loan. It's got um pretty low interest rates. So um yeah, I I like this. Um the the, the what I like the most about this again is, is like it it makes geothermal an option for a lot of people who uh where that the the cost of a, a standard system is, is out of reach. Um you know, we didn't mention this, but it, we're saying it, it's eligible for our rebate program. The, these are uh, Energy Star qualified um, units that you have. Um, so yeah, it's there. It's all you know. It meets all the requirements for the rebates and the tax credits and stuff. Um, so yeah, that's um, again. I, I, I so I appreciate you guys coming uh, talking to us today. Um, let's see, if there's other questions, Alex. We can. Uh, I'll stop talking and we can keep keep going with this. There's more questions. Yeah, absolutely no worries. <clears throat> we do have a couple more questions here. Jim, I'm trying to read a question, and it looks like he's asking, is it correct to say that in one day of constant use, the small unit uses about 2,880 gallons of water spilled out onto a yard? So he's basically multiplying two times 24 times 60, and that comes out with 2,880 2, gallons. Jim, if I butchered that question, feel free to raise your hand. I can take you off mute here, and you can better explain that if you'd like. No, that's that's accurate. That's accurate. Yeah. And okay. again, we're we're burying a drain tile. We typically will go twenty foot of solid to get away from the home and then perforated. And unless it's clay, the water often doesn't get to the end of the of the of the drain tile, uh, sand or rock. Uh, clay, obviously you gotta get to a I mean there's usually a ditch or pond. Again, it's it's case by case. We have to look at the home. Um but that water, again, in most cases we're burying that, so it's it's uh, it's not like it's spilling out onto the yard. And it, I think it's one of these things where you got to see it. You know, in a lot of cases, I think both the initially, you know, a decade plus ago, where most contractors like this thing's too small. This is just, you know, this doesn't make sense. And then they see it and put some in and go, oh, I guess it is working, kind of a thing. And I and I think even on the water flow in and out, when you see it, you go. Oh, that's it. You know, so I, I think it's one of those things where these are, you know, again, good questions. And uh, I know, Eric, you expressed interest in seeing the one there in Northern Vermont, in which we'll, we'll get that set up. But, um, you know, I think, like I say, just kind of seeing our version of it is often eye opening to to contractors. So, yeah, and, and, you know, at, at that 2,800 gallons a day, that would be if uh, the 18,000 BTU unit was running. 24 hours in that day, which would, you know, may happen on colder winter days, but normally you don't run that uh, 24 hours a day. The unit is cycling. Um, but also, you know, and it sounds like a lot of water, but in the scheme of things, you'll find that most regulations regarding water withdrawal, um, re uh, regulations and permitting typically don't, don't kick in until it's over, in Michigan, it's 10,000 gallons. I think in Vermont, it's 20,000 gallons per day before any kind of uh, withdrawal permitting is required. So um, it's uh, it's not, you know, and of course, you know, you want to look into local regulations and things like that um, at all times because a municipality may have regulations that are much different than the, the state regulations. Thank you, Jim. 
very much. Uh, we, Bruce had a question. Uh, could you talk a little bit more about the handling of outflow of water? Okay, that's kind of what we were just talking a little bit about. And again, that's going to be every every home is going to, it's site specific. So every home may be a little different. Um, in Michigan, we've got relatively sandy soil in most areas. So just using a drain tile, uh, like in the picture you see here now, tends to work really well. Um, if, uh, if the local soil conditions are all solid clay, then of course you're not going to absorb much water. So you've got to have some place for the water to go. Um, since this is typically a rural home application, there's usually some property where you can get it over to an area of trees, tree line, or a swale, or a, a pond, perhaps. Um, someplace where it won't create a nuisance is the, is the uh, target. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, that's, that's great. Um, thank you. Eric, do you have something? Yes. Um... When you have a fully ducted system, say with a gas furnace existing, and you want to set up your unit in parallel with that, are you saying that the uh, GO unit oper can operate independently without the existing furnace on a fan setting with no burner? That's That's what I didn't quite understand. Yes, for sure. If you look at the, uh, because the Well Connect, the geo unit, it has its own blower in it. So it'll be running by itself most of the time. And then periodically the furnace may kick on to provide some supplemental heating. But the, right. the so the main damper that's doing the, the job is that one you see above the furnace. That keeps the discharge air from the Well Connect from short circuiting through the furnace and into the return um getting sucked back into the return of the well connect so it has to the supply air from the well connect has to go out the supply registers of the uh, duct work but then if, if for whatever reason um the furnace is running and the well connect is not running the damper in the well connect does the same function it keeps the air from short circuiting through the well connect into the return air and of course, when they both are running in parallel simultaneously, uh, all the discharge air from both of them is going into the supply duct system. Right. Share, share so, return. Is that a motorized damper or? No, nope, it's just a gravity damper. Okay. Yeah. And it, it Thank works you. really well. Yeah. One more question. Also, a little side note here from Dexter. He said that we created a 7525 model using two years of Vermont temp data and offered hybrid sizing and agreed to the concept. That's very deep, Dexter. Thanks for sharing. We do have a question from Jim asking about the AC side of things. So in the midsummer, is water consumption similar when using AC to GPM? About yeah, normally you're running, just leaving the same reg flow regulator in place for AC. Actually, the unit can run with with uh, considerably less water in air conditioning mode than it actually needs uh, to run efficiently. So, you know, we've had a few people who put a, a two flow regulators on there and switch it over, have a summer setting and a winter setting, um, because you can use less water and still get very efficient air conditioning. Um, the other thing on the, again, because we're generally smaller on average, um, we're running longer cycles, it's pulling a lot of moisture out of the home. So again, people do rave about the comfort of the performance of the air conditioning with these. Yeah, the, the air conditioning capacity is a little greater than the heating capacity on both models. So the one and a half ton unit is closer to two ton uh, cooling capacity, and the uh, two and a half is closer to three tons, like thirty four thousand BTUs cooling capacity. And as Tim said, it really dehumidifies well because it has a a large microchannel coil in it. Looks like there was a 
add on to that question. Thank you for answering. I said next one. Has anyone created cisterns to retain the water for gardening or other uses? Uh, yeah. Uh, there's people using the discharge water for all kinds of things, feeding animals on a farm and uh, that kind of stuff. But um, you're typically a cistern, you'll still need an overflow on it because, you know, you'd need a lot if you're... <laughs> If you've got a 2,000 gallon tank as a cistern, um, you know, you'll fill it up in a, in a day possibly or less. Um, so you would still need it to go somewhere, but yeah, there's no reason you can't collect that water and, and uh, use it for any number of things. Um, it could be used for gray water in a home. It's very neat, thank you. It's about give it a minute or two see if you have any other questions but otherwise looks like that was about it for questions this has been great so thank you both tim and chris and everyone else for joining yeah, we'll give another minute or two for questions if you have anything else we do have one awesome do you have plans to expand into a larger commercial side of things uh well i meant i showed you a picture of our the building i'm in and we're <laughs> We are using well connects, but that I wouldn't say is our, we don't have plans for that. Um, there are, you know, there are commercial properties, rural commercial properties that have a well that could certainly use this. Maybe in that case would be more supplemental than primary, like we're doing in residential, but uh, we even have some well drillers that, uh, that have them in their place, but they're, uh, Again, I'd say in those cases, in a larger facility, they're more supplemental than they are primary. But it's still, you know, they actually save more money because they're running all the time and, and putting in cheap ETUs. So um, from a design standpoint, I don't know. You know, we're not looking to have larger well connects. We've toyed with three and a half ton. And, you know, frankly, when you look at some of these incentives in different states that want you to get to 90 percent of the load, you know, we already are we're not in we're not at 90 percent of maybe the manual j hourly load but when you look at the course of the winter we're doing 90 percent. so we really feel like oh, we don't want to oversize things and because you lose comfort benefit too so um long long answer to a simple question we aren't we aren't really targeting commercial no so yeah and the other the other issue is um you know we were designed we designed this to work with an existing domestic water system, well water system. Um, very few domestic wells are, you know, if you've got a, a five or six ton uh, open loop geo system that's using, you know, 12 or 15 gallons a minute, um, most domestic wells aren't gonna support that. You don't have the, the capacity, the yield uh, to do that. So we wanted to make sure that a good, a good um, percentage of existing wells could be used for this application. Now on commercial, you know, you could put a, a big well, a high capacity well on a big building and, uh, and do a bunch of open loop units in that uh, building. And that's done frequently, has been for many years. You know, sometimes they use an intermediate heat exchanger for the well water to the loop water in the building. Sometimes they go direct. So that's an option. Um, of course, when they get into something of that scale, a lot of times they'll just put a big closed loop system in. So, but yeah, we haven't, you know, there's there's plenty of big heat pumps out there available <laughs> that we didn't see the need to really can add to that. This is really the essence of the system is the simultaneous operation with an existing fossil fuel furnace and, and you know, get in, get out and, uh, you know, that, that that market is, you know, there are between where you guys are and we are, there are millions of existing water wells that can handle this system in homes that are heating with propane and heating oil. And those that's what we want to help those people. So yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Anyone else has any other questions? Feel free to put them in the chat. Raise your hand. Otherwise, you know, I encourage I, I linked above in the chat. So 
resources and links to our Efficiency Vermont's Ground Source Heat Pump Rebate page. If you have any questions about that, feel free to reach out to myself and I can get you in touch with the right people. Yeah, I'd encourage you to visit our website. Um, on our installation page, there's a 10 minute video that highlights Chris and it uh, walks you through an overview of a typical installation. And uh, again, I'd encourage you just to check that out and then reach out to us with any other questions going forward. And and again, we we need uh, we need people out east to to uh, work the leads and install systems. So hopefully, we can work with most many of you folks going forward. So, um, Phil, thanks for setting this up and your team. And yeah, um, thank you, um, Tim. Chris and, and Tim, thanks again for um, coming out to Better Buildings by Design last week. Uh, it was good to see you in person, and uh, I'm glad you uh, were able to get out and uh, check out the conference, too. So maybe we'll see you again there next year. Absolutely. Um, and maybe, yeah, we'll be working with some folks here in Vermont, and we'll see some, some projects come in. So, again, I thank you both for your time. Thank you, everybody, for uh, joining the call this morning. Appreciate that. Appreciate the work that you all do. And, and Alex, appreciate uh, you facilitated this morning. Thanks for setting this up. Yep, no problem. You.